Our final speaker is Mr. Joseph Sobrin. Joe is a senior editor of National Review, syndicated columnist, author, uh, I would say one of, if I can quote Bill Buckley in a, uh, a uh, uh, blurb on the back of, of Joe's book, uh, the clearest and most eloquent moral voice in America, I think that's an accurate uh, uh, paraphrase of what Buckley said, and I, th I certainly think it's true. I'm not sure Bill Buckley's changed some since those days. I don't know that he would still say that even though he ought to, because it was true. Uh, Joe's, uh, for those of you who aren't lucky enough to see Joe's, Joe's column, is just uh, fantastic. And we're very proud, of course, to have him as a media fellow of the Institute, and uh, well, always one of the most popular and uh, uh, Take read and taken seriously uh, writers in the free market and uh, very proud to uh, introduce him to you now. He's going to speak to us about what the U.S. government response ought to be, or I guess rather ought not to be, uh, to the desocialization, uh, what we hope will be the desocialization of uh, Russia and of Eastern Europe. Joe Sobern. Thank you, Lou, for a generous introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I guess we really all know what the answer to the question is. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. government should do nothing, uh, or rather should dismantle its own, its own forces, its own bureaucracy. Uh, we should uh, end the NATO alliance. The most uh, stunning thing I've seen lately on the end of the Cold War was in the Washington Post. It was just the headline. I didn't even bother reading the article. It was an opinion piece saying that we need the NATO allow alliance now more than ever. And I thought this was a great exemplification of Kennedy's law. This is Jim Kennedy, uh, so don't be alarmed. He uh, is a friend of a friend of mine. He says that institutions tend to perpetuate themselves, if necessary, at the expense of their original purposes. And I think that is... Uh, a great human and uh, economic insight, too. Such is the case here. NATO was founded for a very specific purpose. That purpose no longer plausibly exists. And yet, there is no, uh, no serious move to dismantle it. On the contrary, the effort seems to be now to find new excuses for preserving it. Well, this is the typical behavior of, uh, of government bureaucracies, of anything, uh, of anything subsidized. Uh, we, uh, we shouldn't be surprised at this at all. Um, I, I think it would be banal for me in this company to give a list of steps that we ought to take, because I assume we're in agreement, and I assume I'm, pr I'm probably the least qualified person in this room to uh, spell out the practical steps that we, uh, we ought to take in a sense. We should end foreign aid. We should form no alliances unless we meet an enemy that we can't whip by ourselves. We should dissolve uh, the international bureaucracies. And of course, we should cut taxes accordingly and stop talking about a peace dividend for anyone except the American taxpayer. Now, the, of course, the taxpayer will be the last to see the dividend, the, the, the way things go. Uh, our elected representatives, or as I like to call them, our re-elected representatives, talk, talk with a very proprietary air of the, well, that reminds me, by the way, of one of the, one of the, uh, the better jokes I've heard about the Soviet Union from a few years ago. Uh, question, do the Soviet people eat caviar? Answer, yes, through their elected representatives. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is the world's most non-aligned nation? Afghanistan, it doesn't even interfere in its own affairs. <laughs> well, happily, these jokes may soon be passe, so let's enjoy them while we can. 
At any rate, our re-elected representatives are already talking as if the peace dividend is simply their, their property, as if it's simply theirs to spend. I used to hold this very naive view of government, according to which government takes in ta uses the taxing power only to cover the costs of its necessary functions. And sure, there's bound to be a little waste here and there, but basically uh, that's marginal. Um, well, I've come to see it considerably uh, differently now, and I'm realizing how differently people in power see it, too. The, um, but um, in this talk of uh, dissolving, or, or, or I, sh I should say in this talk of what we should do uh, after the Cold War, it's very rarely suggested by anyone within the Beltway that we really ought to withdraw militarily from the world. It's, it's called, of course, isolationism, this proposition. It's thought to be equivalent to, uh, well, uh, to use a sadly topical uh, analogy, to, uh, to becoming the global Greta Garbo. Uh, it, we, we really talk as, it, it, people talk as if we really would be simply alone in a kind of uh, a hermit-like existence if we ended our military ties. I got interested in this general uh, subject a couple of years ago, and uh, there was an incident you may have heard about. I was attacked by a lot of neoconservatives and accused of anti-Semitism for my criticism of the, uh, of our alliance, as it's called, with Israel. Now, the first thing to notice about this kind of, of attack, and it was about the last thing I thought of, was is that the ground of the argument was changed. We were told that Israel was our reliable ally and a strategic asset, and therefore it was in the U.S. interest to uh, maintain this connection and to supply foreign aid to Israel. I was puzzled by this at first because I, I just couldn't see what the U.S. was getting out of the deal here. I couldn't see how giving this money to Israel was instrumental to the welfare of the U.S. If anything, it seemed to be the opposite. I thought we are losing uh, potential allies against communism and estranging friendly or, or, for, or at least formerly neutral countries. So to, it seemed ironic to me to say that Israel was our only ally because it seemed to me that the, the only reason it was our only ally was that it had driven everyone else uh, away and turned everyone else against us. Well, when this controversy such as it was erupted, nobody thought to refute me on those grounds. Well, one, one did. Joshua Moravchik did. The others didn't even try. The whole content, the whole discussion became a, a series of assertions about my motives. Well, whatever my motives might be, there my arguments were waiting to be answered, and they didn't really get a satisfying answer. The whole ground of the discussion was changed. And as I've watched over the years, I've noticed how, how many of the things I've said about Israel could really be generalized to allies of ours whose, um, uh, you know, which at that point, I, uh, I take it for granted as necessary to us. The, uh, of course, there is no simple U.S. national interest, but there are things that are more and less good for Americans in general, and that's about all you can say in the way of defining a national interest unless you identify the nation's interest as the interest of a regime. But in the case of Israel, uh, I came to realize something else. I mean. An alliance, after all, is a kind of contingent, practical, purposeful arrangement. You make an alliance with somebody when you have a common enemy. You can make an alliance even with a Stalin against a Hitler. That's not to say it's a good idea, that we were right or wise or anything else to do it, but at least it's conceivable, it's arguable. That doesn't mean that you should confuse uh, this ally with a friend. An alliance is a totally different kind of uh, relation, and it's secondary, whereas a friendship is a, is a direct, a primary kind of relation. You're not friends for any specific purpose. You're friends 
period. Whereas you're an, an, when you have an ally, you have an ally because of some common goal or common enemy, especially an enemy. Well, with Israel, it seemed to work the other way around. First, we got a very expensive ally, and then we got the enemies. So, again, I've, I've been unable to see what was in it for the United States. And, in fact, it seems to me that the U.S.'s real relation with Israel is of a different kind. Uh, at one level, Israel is a client state, and uh, it's possible to be uh, cynical about that. I think one should be cynical about it in a certain way. But on the other hand, um, there's friendship between the two countries. There's a sentimental link that goes much deeper than the uh, uh, than whatever quote alliance may exist. In fact, the whole reason we have an Israel lobby in this country is that there are people, and not just Jews, who are very emotionally attached to Israel. And the uh, so accounts for our closeness to Europe. It's to call it a sentimental tie is not to belittle it in the least. On the contrary, I think the sentimental ties are much more profound than military alliances, much less contingent. And they deserve to be respected. At the same time, they exist independently of government. And this, I think, is the crux of the issue as regards Europe and the United States after the Cold War. We don't need Europe as an ally because we don't have an enemy now. You can, the, the argument can be made and is made by people I greatly respect, like Murray, that we shouldn't have treated the Soviet, you shouldn't have had this nationalistic opposition to the Soviet Union in the first place. I won't get into that, that whole question here. But at any rate, it seems to me no longer plausible and um, to, to insist that we need these alliances now. The Soviet Union is clearly not an effective enemy, if it's an enemy at all. It can't even hold its own former empire together. It's had to release most of its satellite possessions. Uh, it poses no threat to us, couldn't threaten us if it wanted to, except with nuclear weapons. The old idea that it was engaged in, in global subversion is well, very tattered at this point. So, uh, what should we do? Why do we need NATO under the circumstances? Well, we don't. We just don't. We don't need allies without enemies. It's absurd. Now, I, I was slow to face up to this because this was my Israel, in a sense. This was the alliance that I had a huge sentimental investment in. And there's no reason to give up that investment. There's also no reason to sustain the alliance. They're two different things. The, um, first of all, it had become irrational long ago, even in Cold War terms, for the United States to bear the cost of defending Western Europe. The, the democracies there had fully recovered from the exhaustion of World War II, and our presence was more inertial than strategic. I think that the U.S. simply enjoyed the feeling of being a great power and leader of the free world. I think this was the popular feeling that sustained NATO. We liked to feel that we were needed in this, in this major role. Um, but with, when the idea of dissolving NATO occurs, I think the first emotional reaction of many Americans is to think that this would mean completely cutting ourselves off from Europe. They've come to feel that somehow the alliance and the friendship are inseparable from each other, that we'd completely lose touch with what for many of us is our ancestral homeland and our cultural ties, and in some cases even our living kinsmen, if we were to uh, cease the alliance. Our national sense of identity, I think, is still profoundly European. Well, as I say, I don't at all want to belittle these sentimental links. I think that these are the things that actually that constitute societies. And yet, 
nowadays it's very hard for people to imagine a society except with the idea of a government built into it. There's even an assumption that uh, it's a government that not only constitutes a society but endows it with whatever cohesion it has. But it can't exist without a government. Certainly the NATO bureaucrats, military and civilian, will try to persuade us that we'll lose touch with Europe without them. This is a perverse wishful thinking on their part. Governments simply don't like to admit that we can do without them. And it's very hard f after you've been subjected to this assumption for a long time, not only explicitly but implicitly, to, uh, to shake it. I found in, in a number of fields I've given some study to, uh, the same pattern prevails. People don't like a, don't, people don't believe a proposition because it's proved as much as they believe it because it seems to prove other things. In other words, they derive ideas from a presupposition, they systematize the presupposition so much that they can't think without it anymore. They can't imagine the world as understood through another presupposition. And so the, the cult of government is stronger than ever at the end of a century when governments have done incomparable damage to mankind. I was saying in California the other day in the middle of a debate that here we are at the end of a century of socialism almost. Socialism and related world wars, mass murders, the threat of nuclear war. And we're still being warned about the robber barons of the 19th century as if these were the clear and present danger. We're still being told of the horrors of capitalism at the time of its peak of freedom and attractiveness to immigrants. The, uh, the cognitive dissonance here is just astounding to me. The, we're, we're, we're also facing now um, a, a series of, um, well, uh, we're being presented with false alternatives. The collapse of communism is being represented as the uh, triumph and vindication of democracy, quote, unquote. Uh, I hope, rather, that it's the beginning of the end of collectivism. But the, the issue hasn't been defined very well. After all, democracy really is only a, a principle of succession. It's a way of deciding who's going to rule next. It beats the knife fight and maybe hereditary rule in some ways. But it also has its, it has its drawbacks, especially when it becomes a way of uh, bribing people for support. And in fact, the innovation of democracy is uh, the mass bribery that uh, people like Madison and Mill foresaw as a danger and that Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson saw as an opportunity. The, uh, the triumph of, uh, or rather the dissolution of communism in no way uh, constitutes the uh, vindication of democracy as we know it, of course. These are not polar opposites. They don't exhaust or encompass the possibilities of government, and I think it's up to people who favor a return to, or the, the achievement, if you like, of a genuinely free society to insist that the right lessons be drawn from this. This was not some Gotterdammerung of principles, uh, or I should say Armageddon of principles, uh, in their final showdown. It's just that one form of collectivism has completely collapsed, and the other, to judge by, say, the city we're sitting in, uh, isn't doing so well either. We're even hearing another kind of argument now, that terrible forces have been released by the end of communism. Uh, Islamic fundamentalism, another other kinds of Arab fanaticism, uh, various nationalisms and bigotries in Eastern Europe, especially anti-Semitism, 
The columnist Charles Krauthammer the other day insisted that this is no time to disarm because we may face a worse danger in post-Soviet Russia than we have lately. It's turning out that communism has kept the peace. It kept us out of war. <laughs> the new enemy may be worse. Again here, the root idea is that only government produces social cohesion. It's very hard even for a man as intelligent as Krauthammer to penetrate critically to the roots of his own thinking, to see his presupposition and to think it through again. I thought his column, in fact, was striking in its incoherence. This is not usually how he writes. Something, uh, something has addled him, and I think it is the specter of Russian nationalism. Treaties, aid programs, troops, bureaucrats, loans, credits, all these things are thought to make up the relations between countries. How can we communicate without them? How can we even be in touch with Europe or related to it without them? Well, we can, as I don't, as I don't have to tell you. The, the foreign policy question that's posed now is really which governments should our government be propping up? <laughs> it seems to be the function of governments to support each other in power, like the crowned heads of Europe in the old days, calling each other cousin and embracing at their meetings. The, uh, well, it's so many of the things I, I could say would be so obvious to you that I, I won't bother. It's just that, well, <laughs> uh, governments simply aren't good at, uh, at the things they profess to be good at. We don't need international socialism or an international savings and loan bailout to start up economies. They'll start themselves or nothing will start them. We don't need to deliver foreign aid or troops to other countries. Uh, it, it would certainly serve some interest to do so, but it wouldn't serve ours in any particular way. And in fact, it would be against the interest of the ordinary free human being for governments, to be, for governments to continue these kind of relations. It seems to me they've been unremittingly unfortunate and sometimes disastrous over the, over the course of this entire century. It seems to me that the prophets of doom always fell short in their gloomy predictions from World War I to the present. The, uh, uh, well, when I hear people refer, for, for example, to Watergate, I always, as if it taught us some great lesson, I always think that anyone who needed Richard Nixon to shake his faith in government was a slow learner. Uh, and I have felt uh, supported in this conviction by Robert Caro's new uh, emerging biography of Lyndon Johnson. Well, this should be a, a time of great celebration. We, we've gotten from Mr. Gorbachev a kind of reverse Pearl Harbor, a sneak surrender, if you will. <laughs> and it seems to me that the powers that be in the West have been very sore winners, very reluctant to accept this victory and very nervously looking for new excuses to continue what they've been doing all this time. I find this even in the, in the conservative movement. I thought we'd all be happy when this happened. I mean, I didn't think it would ever happen. And this has even caused me to uh, look anew at, uh, at that movement and at its investment in the, in the Cold War. Uh, so many of us have been uh, I mean, I assume we were all thinking along the lines of Jim Burnham, whom I respected tremendously and still do, who took a very analytic, precise, 
view of the whole global struggle as he thought it. And using Burnham's logic, this is the time when we should simply disarm. We don't face this threat anymore, if we ever did. But let's, let's uh, posit that we did. Let's posit that it was real. Well, now is the time when we ought to be admitting that we've won and enjoying it. And on the contrary, this, this is now talked about as a very problematic situation in the West. As I say, the, the winners don't seem to feel that they've won. Well, we have won. We've won. The people have won. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great moment for humankind. But it's a very anxiety-producing moment for governments. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, let's see. I'll close by mentioning... Uh, what I thought was another of these astonishing arguments. Uh, when, when the U.S. invaded Panama, George Will argued for this on a curiously contradictory, uh, self-contradictory ground. On the one hand, he argued that it was an act of good neighborliness to do this. And on the other, he said it was entailed by our own nature. We have to be ourselves, our democratic selves, by imposing democracy elsewhere. And uh, again, I notice what I've noticed so often in studying the left, that its rationale keeps shifting in order to sustain the desired conclusion. When the... When the... Uh, Well, when one, when one argument for a position fails, another argument for the same position is found. The position itself is never abandoned. The rationale for socialism or socialist policies I, I've found for years uh, shifted amazingly among the progressive-minded, and I inferred from this the bad faith of the left. Now I'm starting to wonder about the faith of the right when I find the same evasions especially an evasion of what should be the right's own triumph. So uh, I return to my original proposition that this is the time for all good men to do nothing. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yeah. I hate to disagree with you, but the idea of congressional candidates having night fights really appealed to me. <laughs> Great. That's all half the problem. Yeah. By the way, it's, uh, I, I noticed that uh, Barney Frank has announced he is going to run for re-election. And it prompted me to wonder if his campaign would be eligible for NEA funding. I came here to, to prepare to hear you argue about how socialism could be eliminated in Eastern Europe. Uh, the, day, the day that uh, um, Mikhail Gorbachev waved the wand and said that we weren't threatened any longer, I don't believe the Soviets dismantled any ICBM. And they're still there. In fact, he may not even control them, but that, is, again, is not a source of, uh, of uh, sense of security. I think you should visit uh, the president of, of uh, Czechoslovakia in Prague, perhaps the prime minister of Poland, uh, maybe the prime ministers of Western Europe who worry about Germany much more than I do. None of those people want to have NATO dissolved. Clearly, the U.S. Role, military role should be smaller, but uh, I think there are very few Europeans who feel that secure about the Soviet Union yet. Well, it, it may be that Russia will pose some sort of threat to its neighbors in the near future, but the, the old uh, international messianic form of communism is dead. Now, yes, it can, they, they can still hit us with missiles, obviously, but uh, they'd be, they're, they're, it wouldn't serve any particular purpose and would obviously be terribly dangerous for them. I don't see why, except as a kind of accident, that should 
frighten us any longer. It would ruin the whole day. Yes, it would, if it happened. But why would it happen? Yeah. What uh, strong argument would you propose against, uh, say, congressmen wanting so badly to give some money to Poland? I, I would love to, to convince them to just stop doing this, that uh, they're so willing. When President Bush was reluctant and scroogey, they said, well, man, we just have to give them more money. Uh, I would like, I don't know, I, I, I have my own argument, but I would like to, to hear yours. Well, I don't have any argument for a politician who wants to give money to Poland because I don't think politicians are responding to arguments. I think they do this simply in order to confirm the idea that life can't go on without them. And so you know, somehow we, we can't have, we can't even have capitalism in Europe without socialist measures, international socialist measures, to ensure that it occurs. This is the way the politician characteristically thinks. So I don't, I, I don't think you can really reason them out of it maybe one at a time, if you get them alone in a room, they'll agree with you until they go out again and, and, and uh, meet the press. Uh, you seem to uh, not worry about the possibility that Bruce will take over Russia that might be able to use nuclear weapons against the richer country, or possibly a return to some kind of stock. Well, I haven't worried about it. Now you may start me worrying about it, but I, I don't know. There are lots of possibilities that uh, that could occur. Well, 